So John Locke, uh, especially his empiricism, we'll talk a little bit more about John Locke later on uh, regarding his political views. Uh, but I want to focus on his, uh, his metaphysical views uh, at this stage of the game. So the metaphysics of John Locke are, are described in an essay concerning human understanding. So he tries to explain how the human mind uh, operates and even, you know, where it comes from. What is, you know, he's trying to describe what is the human mind. For Descartes, you know, he said the mind or the soul is the thinking substance, it's a thinking thing. That is somehow, and he has a lot of trouble connecting it to the body, as we saw. Um, but Locke wants to say, well, let's not make any assumptions about what the mind is. But let's take our perceptions of the world very seriously and think in a scientific way about how perceptions impact us so as to give rise to what we, we understand as the mind. Okay, so, and, and, and now he makes a lot of assumptions here, but it is, but he does such a good job at constructing this story and tying it in with, with things that seem consistent with uh, Newtonian physics uh, that in general, especially for English speaking people, so, uh, you know, Britons, uh, uh, and people who are educated in, in England, uh, even, you know, people living in India who are educated in England, South Africans, Australians, um, people who live in the United States uh, or in the, in the English colonies at this time. Uh, in the English speaking world, John Locke's, Locke's metaphysics just becomes like assumed. It's just all this metaphysics is just assumed and it's not questioned. And so for, you know, a couple of hundred years here, there's just no question about this and in the English speaking world. And at the same time, in the German speaking world and even in France and, you know, most of continental Europe, non the non-English speaking philosophical world, the metaphysics is engaged with or even just assuming the Leib Leibnizian uh, or some modification of Leibniz as just goes without question. And so this is where we get the big division between continental philosophy, which is on the side of Leibniz, idealism, rationalism, and an Anglo uh, philosophy, and maybe I should put Anglo philosophy in England and then on the continent of Europe, you have continental Leibnizian type uh, metaphysics. And in England, you have uh, Lockean metaphysics. And those things just sort of go without question. And then, and then the two philosophical schools have trouble talking uh, at a certain level of uh, metaphysics. Um, but continental philosophy is, is conscious that they're doing metaphysics. So that, that is a little bit better, uh, but in England, uh, they just act as if they're not doing metaphysics and just assume that what John Locke says is truth. Okay, so, uh, and that persists for, uh, yeah, for really 200 years. And, and then the Anglo-English way of thinking uh, ends up in the United States. And even to this day, there's this big divide between Anglo-American philosophy and continental philosophy. 
because you're always ha if if you want to if you want to get into metaphysics, you always have to ha somehow prove that Locke is wrong. But if we really think about it, Locke it, it is obviously proved to be wrong. Okay, so it's, he didn't have a, a, a total good picture. So, uh, but he was just very much along the lines of Descartes. He's trying to work it out, um, and does a good job at getting something up and running. And so this is kind of taking one aspect of Descartes and really running with it, that, that physical part, where Descartes even claimed like the human body could just run without itself, without a soul. Locke wants to take that very seriously, and maybe we don't even have to think about all this Aristotelian stuff. Let's just jettison the Aristotelian stuff and just think of those Cartesian uh, ideas of uh, a self-regulating system of physical forces and just make some assumptions about that and run with it. Okay. So what Locke uh, believes is that the mind is initially when we're born does not have innate ideas. And remember that part of the Cartesian argument in the meditations is that we discover innate ideas, um, ultimately innate ideas, uh, any a particular innate idea about God. Um, but what Locke wants to say is that when we're born, our mind is a blank slate. It's a tabla rasa, which just means blank slate. And he also has an atomic theory of reality so that the monads now the the fundamental building blocks are not spiritual monads as Leibniz suggests but are physical particles and remember with the example I, I did with with Leibniz Leibniz said you could just keep dividing a cannonball in into half and then force and then eights the 16th, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that would go on infinitely. You would never get to the end of this division problem, uh, division process. Uh, you know, your knife or whatever you're cutting it with might have trouble getting, you know, but in principle, you could always make a, a, a more razor sharp uh, cutting device and keep cutting ever, ever, ever so much smaller. And, um, you know, we think of like nanotechnology today, you could make a, a cutting device that's operating at nano level, which, you know, we, we really conceive of today, which seem like not so likely in Leibniz's day or in Locke's day. And what Locke said is that you get to atomic particles. At some point in the division process, you will get to hard pieces that cannot be divided. And these are atoms. And this is an ancient idea going back to the ancient Greeks. Um, but, it's re but it's revived in this time. Um, Boyle was, was thinking in these atomic terms. So Boyle, the, the chemist, uh, was thinking in atomic terms. And then Locke is trying to say, okay, let's assume that there are atoms. Uh, and this is the, the ground floor of our metaphysics is that we assume that there are particles that cannot be divided. And these are the building blocks out of which the universe is built. And, uh, and so we make this atomic assumption and we make this assumption about the mind being a tabla rasa. And then, uh, and then we try to explain how atoms bumping into each other and clumping together in certain ways cause perceptions through our body, which is also atomic and made up of uh, atoms and is particles bumping in and clumping together in certain ways and impacting our mind, which is a blank slate. And he even wants to describe it as like a 
a piece of wax and and then as uh, as particles hit the mind in some way at some level he can't explain the whole process just like Descartes couldn't totally but he's like okay let's just think about it in this way but the, there then there's particles hitting this blank slate which is like a, a, a slate wax slate which is a thing that was existed in school so like when you're listening to a lecture uh, back in the day at this time you would have a a, a, a slate a, a board that was covered with wax and then you would etch your notes into the wax and it's kind of like a whiteboard you know because you could erase it and then start over but this is um this is like kind of their their version of a whiteboard at the time and he's thinking okay we have this blank slate so you have a fresh waxed slate and then particles are hitting this and making impressions on it and the pattern of particulate uh, impact on the wax and the, the indentation and the modification that they make to the wax is what then forms our mind. And, and he tries to, you know, he tries to develop that as much as he possibly can, but it's all very kind of loose. Okay, so then, um, So, so that underlying, those underlying assumptions are what are going on. Um, and, and just like Leibniz was making a lot of assumptions. Okay, so you get this system of metaphysics up and running, and then you can make some nice conceptual distinctions. And so the real value of what Locke did and what he was able to accomplish by setting up this uh, metaphysical narrative is that he made a clear distinction between primary versus secondary qualities. So, um, which, you know, at an intuitive level, once you buy into this basic metaphysics and you throw away uh, Aristotelianism, uh, you know, starts to starts to make sense and it's very attractive. And and so, if we think about the the uh, let's think of an apple and we think about um the reddish hue of, of an apple um so the the reddish color of an apple um Locke would describe the red color as a secondary quality and so there's this distinction between qualitative versus quantitative. And I've spoken in these terms throughout the lectures quite a bit. Uh, but here we wanna really focus on what's the difference between quality versus quantity. And Locke has a good common sense explanation uh, for it. And that's, that's where this really gets traction is that let's think of the reddish color of the apple he's going to call that a secondary quality the the red color is not in the apple because the apple is just made up of atoms and those atoms are st structured together clumped as i was saying clumped together in some way that it forms the the structure of the apple but at some level the color of the apple is also a product of the atoms that are in the apple. And so he wants to say that the color doesn't really exist in the apple. And now notice this all sounds very much like metaphysics, right? I'm still, we're using a lot of the same lingo and talking about things being in them and what is in, in them, really in them and not really in them. Whenever you say really, you're doing metaphysics. Um, and so, the apple isn't really red. The apple is a bunch of atoms that only have geometric extension. And the atoms are indivisible, but they have shape. And when they clump together in the apple kind of way, 
those on the surface, the way that those atoms clump together and adhere together in some way, the surface pattern, which is now a geometric pattern. So again, this is very Cartesian because Descartes, you know, wrote that geometry, and now we're we're thinking of the the difference between extension and extended thing, like the body, the human body, versus a non-extended thinking thing, the mind. And Locke just wants to talk all about extended things, things that exist in physical space and have geometric shape, that have length, breadth, and depth. Um, and so on the surface of the apple, there's some sort of physical shape. And when the rays of the sun hit that surface pattern and then bounce off, and of course, Descartes did a whole work on optics and optics became a very popular subject and a lot of progress was made over this time period regarding optics. But on the surface, the, the rays of the sun hit, hit the uh, surface of the apple, which at a minuscule atomic level has a shape and a surface pattern that bounces the rays of the sun off of the apple and into the eye. And maybe these rays are even particles themselves. And this is something as far as I know is still not resolved, uh, whether the rays of the sun are, are particles, whether we have photon particles or just or just wave uh, phenomenon. But let's think of a photon coming from the sun. It's a little particle. It hits the surface of the apple and then bounces off and maybe spins in a certain way or who knows what. But it something about the surface of the apple and the way the photon hits the surface and then goes into my eye and then hits the retina and then that travels down the nerves and hits the brain at some level that's like a blank slate and impresses it. The impression made is the redness that I perceive, but that's part of my perceptual apparatus, my nerves and my eye and everything. And the redness that I perceive is not really in the apple. The apple has these physical structures and, uh, you know, a, a being with another perceptual apparatus will perceive it as a different color, potentially, maybe the same color or a different color. Um, and, and that makes a lot of sense in a lot of ways. And, and so this got a lot of mileage, you know, um, at the time and for centuries afterward, and even to this day, we, we want to maintain this, this distinction. Um, you know, if, you're, if you use infrared technology, uh, you're seeing, you know, you can see with infrared goggles, for example, you can see things that you wouldn't normally be able to see with your own perceptual apparatus. Uh, and, and that, you know, that obviously is true. And so the perceptual apparatus is important. And Locke wants to ground everything in atomic particles. And the, and the shape of, a, of atomic particles causing the color, but lots of things like, like um, sound waves, sound, uh, you know, the, the sound coming out of a guitar that sound is the way that we perceive it is not built into the guitar or the strings. Uh, it's the way that they move the particles of air and how those atomic particles hit our eardrum. And then our eardrum and our whole perceptual apparatus interprets all these physical atomic interactions in such a way that it sounds like a song. Okay. Uh, and, and then he goes on to develop simple versus complex ideas, which is also also very uh, an important philosophical distinction and um, and something that also you know solidifies John Locke as a solid philosopher. Um, 
And so you might have uh, the simple idea of, uh, let me think of a good example. Um, well, you, 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 could, you could think of the simple, let's use the apple example again. The redness of the exterior of the apple is a simple idea. So the redness that I perceive on the surface of the apple is a simple idea, but also the whiteness when I cut it open uh, is a simple idea. And in the apple, we have redness and whiteness combined, and that combination is a complex idea. But we also might think of the gross shape of an apple, like the apple shape as being a simple idea. And we combine the apple shape that we perceive and conceive as a simple idea with the redness and we combine them together and we get the, we get an apple that has an overall shape and a color. But then we also have the taste of the apple, which is a simple idea. And we combine all three of these. And so that objects, any object that we pick out at some level has combined in it simple ideas that then make the complex idea of the object. And that's an interesting distinction. Now, a lot of this was covered in Aristotelian metaphysics, but Locke is giving it this atomic interpretation. Okay, so that's the big change is that Locke is reinterpreting metaphysics as an atomic metaphysics. And this atomic metaphysics, even, even when I was a kid, to speak in any other terms with English speakers, they really got confused very fast, right? So, um, because they just couldn't conceive of a world that wasn't along the lines of Locke's metaphysics. It just seemed impossible to them, or dopey, stupid. Um, and, and, and that's changing, okay, so that's changing right now. All right, so I'm gonna cut this video off here and then I will continue on.